This is Gloria J. Fenner in Tucson, Arizona on May 1st, 2019. And I guess this story is going to be about archaeology and me. I'm not sure quite why, perhaps because I'm from an earlier generation, to put it nicely, and my career has not been a typical one for an archaeologist, that is, an academic career or in salvage archaeology. It's been quite varied, I think. I was born in Chicago in 1936, if you can believe that. Uh, and I hate to tell you, but this story is going to start when I was four years old lying on the floor in my grandparents' living room, looking at a book by James Breasted, and trying to decipher page after page of Egyptian hieroglyphics. And it's just gone on from there. There wasn't any time I had any doubts that I could be an archaeologist, and Fortunately, my family and friends were entirely supportive, except for my French grandmother who thought if I had to go to college, I should study home economics. But I'm happy to say that didn't happen. And not only was my family supportive, but all of my colleagues, male and female, were supportive as well. It was just something we didn't discuss, whether women should or shouldn't be in archaeology. It just was. In grade school uh, in Chicago, my sister and I were very fortunate in that my parents took us to many of the wonderful museums in the city, and I absolutely fell in love with the basement of the Field Museum where the Egyptian mummy cases were exhibited. So you see, there was no hope for me. And in fact, uh, I can remember a phase I went through where I would bury artifacts in the backyard and go back a week or two later and excavate them. So it was a normal, grade school career in Chicago, although a little bit later my parents divorced. And when I was in eighth grade, my dad remarried and we moved into the northeasternmost county in Illinois, a small community rural area. I went to a small community high school there, which was a good thing in some respects, but not in others. Uh, the latter being that my stepmother was not only on the high school faculty, but dean of girls. And that meant that my ste stepsister and I had to be uh, a good example for the whole rest of the school. Uh, the good side of that was that my stepmother was a firm believer in education for women and convinced my dad that I really did have to go to college. Now, another good thing about going to that small community high school was there wasn't the academic competition that there would have been in Chicago. And when I graduated in 1954, I received an Illinois legislative uh, award that paid tuition and fees at the University of Illinois. And at that time, of course, it was downstate. After I graduated from high school, I moved back to Chicago where I got a summer job that uh, sent me to IBM school. This is 1954, mind you, to teach me how to key punch. 
And not that that was very interesting, but they hired me back every summer during my undergraduate years, which was very nice. Now we go to the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. My first semester when I went to register, nobody in the humongous hall where registration took place knew what course I should take to become an archaeologist. So they sent me over to the anthropology department. At that time, the department was very small, and of course it was the beginning of the fall semester and there weren't many people around. I did find an office with the door open and there was a very distinguished gentleman inside. So I went in and asked him, and he told me to take Introductory Anthropology 102, and I went on my way. Later, I found out that that distinguished gentleman was Julian Stewart. As I mentioned, it was a small department, four faculty. Two others were John McGregor and Oscar Lewis. There weren't many students, of course, but that changed over the years. The department obtained not only more faculty, but also a lot more students, and I assume that's going on to this day. Uh, my undergraduate years were probably, like most people's, uh, taking more and more anthropology courses and satisfying various uh, course requirements of the university. Uh, Elaine Bloom arrived at the University of Illinois in about 1954 or 1955. I don't remember that she taught courses at the beginning, but she was in charge of the lab, archaeology lab, and also was secretary of the Illinois Archaeological Survey and took care of a lot of uh, the business for that. Then in the fall of 1956, a young Bill Longacre arrived for his sophomore year. Elaine Bloom played a big part in my life while I was in school. Uh, and she was always one for the main chance. The university had a local chapter of the Archaeological Institute of America, and occasionally they had famous archaeologists or classicists come to campus to give lectures. And one year, that was Louis Leakey. And so Elaine got on the phone and invited him to the archaeology lab so we could all meet and talk to him. He told us about his work in East Africa, and we gave him some old Illinois chert so he could demonstrate napping, which was a bit unfortunate because he ended up a little bloody. But, oh well, I'm sure he'd done that before too. Um, he also told us about one of his new young English students who was doing fabulous work in East Africa with chimpanzees. That, of course, was Jane Goodall. Another year, uh, Kathleen Kenyon came to campus, and Elaine invited her over to the archaeology lab uh, to talk to us. Which she did. She told us about her work in the Near East and that after Jericho, her next project, I mean, what can you do after Jericho? You go to Jerusalem, which at that time was in Jordan. Uh, she mentioned that while she took some of her own staff from England, and from uh, the British School of Archaeology in Jerusalem. She also took people from all over the world to join the, the staff for however long, whether it was a week 
or the entire three months that she was in the field. Uh, so after she left, Elaine looked at me and said, you ought to apply to go on that. So I behaved fairly well in my youth, and so I did. I wrote her a letter and asked to join her staff, and by golly, I was accepted. Uh, Elaine, bless her heart, took me to the University of Chicago one day so that I could uh, have lunch with Robert Braidwood, and he could tell me about uh, working in the Near East. I got nothing but support from my family, uh, which mainly meant financial support to get over there. Uh, once I got there, my housing and food would be taken care of. So with the prospect of three months in the Near East in mind, I had to get there, of course. Uh, I couldn't afford to fly, so I got reservations on a passenger ship on the Italian line from New York to Naples, and then a smaller ship from Naples to Beirut. Uh, when I got on the ship in New York, I was seated at a table with several gentlemen uh, who I got to know throughout the trip. And of course, they needed to know what I was doing, where I was going, what I was going to be doing, and so forth. And uh, during the course of the trip, one of them told me I ought to really talk to another gentleman at the table who ran an orphanage in Beirut and was familiar with um, where to stay in Naples, for example, which hadn't really occurred to me up until that point. And so I did, and he took another orphan under his wing. Uh, we stayed at a very nice uh, hotel in Naples for three days. What would I have done had he not taken care of me? It did give me the opportunity to get on a train and go down to Pompeii, which was very nice. Uh, and we walked around the Bay of Naples, went to the National Museum uh, to see more of the uh, Italian archaeology, which was quite wonderful. So then it was time to get on the ship to go to Beirut. It was a smaller ship, fewer passengers on it, of course, and the only place to hang out was in the bar area, which was very pleasant. And I got to meet some English people who were also there. And we got to talking, and we went through the whole routine of who you are, where you're from, where you're going, and so forth. And when I told them I was on my way to Jerusalem to work with Kathleen Kenyon on starting a new project, they were quite amazed because they were part of her English staff doing the same thing. It was uh, the photographer for the summer, uh, Kim Wheeler, Lady Wheeler, and uh, one of the younger people, a student from England. What luck is that? Now, don't ask me what I thought I was going to do between Beirut and Jerusalem, how to get there, where to stay in Beirut in the meantime, and so forth. But this certainly solved all of my problems. We got to Beirut, stayed for a few days in a really neat hotel, native type hotel, that Lawrence of Arabia had stayed in in the olden days. 
And they knew the routine, which was to take service taxis from Beirut to Jerusalem, skirting Israel, of course, because of the political situation. And to remind the younger audience, uh, at this time, Jerusalem was part of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. We stopped in Damascus on the way to have lunch and change taxis. And that gave the photographer the chance to take me to the street called Straight, a famous souk, and walk around and see the scenes. And then it was on to Jerusalem and the British School of Archaeology. And then we actually lived in the old walled city of Jerusalem where the school had rented a building for the duration of the project. Now Kenyon had to uh, dig where she could get permission to dig. And that summer, which was her first summer in Jerusalem, uh, she had, I believe, three sites, one of which was outside the city walls on uh, the side of a valley, the sloping hillside of a valley. And that's where I was located in charge of two five by five meter squares, sort of in the middle of the hill. I had one man who had a hoe and did the initial digging, and two basket boys who took the dirt away. And that's what I did for the next three months. Uh, one nice thing was that Kenyon or others took us on the occasional field trip to see other archaeological sites. Uh, in, in Jordan. Kenyon herself took us to Jericho, which was quite a thrill. Uh, a couple of the other people and I walked down the Wadi Kelt to St. George's Monastery and then beyond into the Jordan Valley. Another time we went to Gumran and went to one of the Dead Sea Scroll Caves with Roland Per Roland DeVoe himself, who excavated Cave One and Gumran. And then uh, when the field season was over, two of us went down to Petra, and that was an incredible uh, visit. It was not the tourist site that it is these days. We camped out in one of the caves. We visited the Roman theater where Penn had a dig, and the director there loaned us one of his workmen, who was one of the local Bedouin, and he took us everywhere we wanted to go. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. Coming back from this wonderful experience, I also had reservations on a ship, but it was a commercial ship that I was going to pick up in Port Said, and it would make stops along North Africa, which I thought would be another great adventure. Unfortunately, when we got back from Petra, there was a message for me saying that the ship had been canceled, which meant that I had no way to get home. Uh, so I had to wire my dad for money, get airplane tickets, and that was also a fun experience because that was in the day when almost every country had their own airline and they would do almost anything to get you to fly their line. So I had an Italian plane from uh, Beirut to Rome. 
When I got to Beirut, a very nice young man met me at the airport, took me to one of those lovely high-rise hotels overlooking the Mediterranean, where I spent the night at the airline's expense, picked me up for dinner, drove me around beautiful Beirut, took me back to the hotel, picked me up the next morning to go back to the airport, where I got on a plane to, as I said, Rome. No nice young man to pick me up at the airport this time, but uh, all of the passengers got on a bus at the airport and drove to a number of different small hotels in Rome for the night. And I sat up behind the driver with my mouth hanging open, looking at all of the archaeology in Rome as we drove by. It, it was quite amazing. <clears throat> when I got to New York City, I discovered that I'd been booked on a flight to Chicago that no longer existed. So I had to call my dad and let him know the change in plans. That meant a little layover in uh, the airport, which was all right because it gave me time to go to a restaurant, have a nice tall cold glass of milk, and a wonderful piece of New York cheesecake. And literally, the tears were running down my face. It tasted so good. When I got to Chicago, my father and stepmother, mother and stepfather, met me at the airport with balloons and noisemakers. A joyous homecoming. And that was the end of that wonderful adventure. I got my bachelor's degree in 1958 and immediately enrolled in graduate school in order to go on my first archaeological field school that summer, led by John McGregor and Bill Beeson, who was a University of Arizona student. That first field school was done in conjunction with the Museum of Northern Arizona, where McGregor had a connection. Eight students in two vehicles drove out from Illinois to Flagstaff. We were five men and three women. We stayed uh, initially at the museum, but almost immediately went out to the site where we were working. Right. We worked on the Sanawa site on a big ranch east of Flagstaff where we lived in tents and ate in the ranch foreman's little house. We had brought our own cook, of course, uh, and had an incredibly wonderful summer. Bill and I dug our very first pit house together. That's, that's an LKF little known fact. Uh, McGregor was very good about educating us about the Southwest. Practically every weekend we went on a field trip to see either a scenic and or archaeological uh, place in northern Arizona. And in fact that's where Bill got the idea of taking the U of A field school at Grasshopper on a long weekend, weekend field trip every summer. At the end of six weeks digging, we all went back to Flagstaff where we stayed in MNA facilities up on the hill for two weeks while we wrote up student reports. Jack Wilson and I did pottery and we were quite thrilled when Harold Colton would come over to see what we were doing and identify the occasional potsherd for us. When I got back home at the end of that wonderful experience, my dad 
asked me, well, what are you going to do now? And I told him I wanted to continue with grad school. And he looked right back at me and said, well, that's nice if you can afford it. I, of course, had absolutely no money. And so I had to go to school half time and work half time for a dollar an hour. Uh, Elaine was very helpful in this regard and hired me to work in the archaeology lab and uh, also to type up Illinois Archaeological Survey site records. I did that probably for two or three years. Had occasional um, hourly wages from key punching somewhere on campus and had two or three years of teaching assistantships uh, during my graduate uh, years. In the summer of 1959, I went on my second archaeological field school. And that's something that McGregor was allowed to do by the university because he worked in two completely different culture areas. Normally, uh, one can't do the same field school two years in a row. Uh, this field school was in northwestern Illinois in the Rock Island Moline area on property owned by John Deere and Company, which of course had their uh, headquarters nearby. It was an absolutely fabulous site. It was an early 19th century Sauk village, and it was part of Blackhawk's village, which made it that more exciting. Uh, for the following summers, Elaine took me and a few other graduate students uh, back to that area to work more on uh, the Blackhawk site as well as other sites in the area. And we also worked up there for occasional weekends and long holidays. The site was that fascinating. Because of Elaine's connection to John Deere Company, uh, sometime during my graduate years, they invited her to come up and excavate John Deere's original blacksmith shop in Grand Detour, Illinois. Uh, one other student and I went with her and we were also assisted by Bill Longacre Sr., who was a physicist. And he came down with some marvelous gadget. I don't know that it was GPR, but it worked like GPR. And so we had a really good idea where to excavate. And so we did that. I got to excavate his actual forge, which I insist is where the West was won. Uh, because of the, his plow's ability to turn over the uh, very tough prairie soils. The company uh, later built a museum at that site. While I was in school, uh, Charles de Peso was working in Chihuahua. The, his work down there went on from 1959 to 1961. About 1960, the woman who was running his field lab left to go do other things. And so he put out an advertisement for a lab supervisor. And Elaine, of course, saw that advertisement and told me to apply for that job. She said, it will be good experience for you. You have to write up a CV and a letter, and it's something you're going to have to do eventually anyway, so this is experience. So I did, of course, and lo and behold, I was offered the job. 
Well, I was in the middle of writing my master's thesis and couldn't do that. <laughs> so I had to write a pitiful letter apologizing uh, and turning down the position. I got my MA in 1962 and joined the doctoral program at Illinois. De Peso and the collection uh, at the end of his field season went back to Amarind, of course. He had a special arrangement with the Mexican government to bring the entire collection back to Dragoon for analysis and writing. Early in 1963, it finally came to him that he was never going to finish that project if he didn't have more help uh, and better educated help than what he had. So he hired John Ronaldo from the Field Museum and advertised a junior position uh, to help. Again, Elaine said, you apply for that job, it's good experience, you have to update your CV, and so forth. So I did, and again I was offered the job. The sad thing for Elaine is, this time I had been in college for nine years, I was just getting a little bit tired of it, uh, it was an absolutely fabulous project to be part of, and it was a chance to get back to the Southwest, which I was very much in love with after my summer in Flagstaff. Elaine got one of the deans of women at Illinois who I knew, and the two of them ganged up on me to try and convince me to stay and get my PhD. But my mind was made up, and I headed for Arizona. Elaine was good enough to pay my way to go with her to Boulder, Colorado for the SAA meetings that spring so I could meet De Peso. Bless her heart. So at the end of June 1963, with a brand new driver's license, and an old rambler. I headed cross country with my cat and my mother and stepfather who insisted on going with me and went to Arizona 